So let's just start. Can you guys see me and hear me? And we'll get started in uh, one minute. Good morning. If you have any garden questions you want to throw out now, please toss them out while uh, we're waiting for people to sign in. Hey, Graham. Love when we get gardeners from around the globe. So today's episode of Garden, uh, Garden Grounds is going to focus on three topics. I do Garden Grounds Live. It's a public live event uh, about twice a month, um, every Thursday, 11 a.m., and we always discuss three topics. And the live will go about 30 minutes. We'll cover the topics. I will answer questions as they come up. I also have PERC memberships, Tier 1 and Tier 2. I can see some people from there. I appreciate you guys signing up. And my PERC memberships, in short, are basically designed to be a garden mentor, answer questions. Um, there's live classrooms. And because it's a membership, the uh, chat group is really small. So each live PERC event, I will stay on as long as you need me to to answer your questions. And this will be, a, I hope, a great source of information for you guys over the season as you're growing because in the tier one you can kind of well you can sign up for the tier one and i do three live mentoring sessions for about an hour each you can ask whatever question you want and i will get the answer to you and the group is wonderful too the chat group will help give you answers so today we're going to talk about uh, no dig versus digging we're going to go over the basic lights for growing indoors. Now's the time that a lot of people start growing indoors. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about ways to save money. And I'll apologize ahead of time, because if you don't live in a place where there's a winter, you usually won't get these sales. So let's start with dig your garden versus no dig your garden. And what does that mean? And of course, right away, it's a polarizing question. Do you dig or do you not dig? And there's never the on switch or the off switch. It's somewhere in between and we'll go over, you know, the points for that. Let me just check real quick. Hello, everybody that's signing in. Let's see if there's any quick questions. Someone did throw out one. Is it too late to add fertilizer for my garden? No, Kelly, if you're um, dropping in organic fertilizers, any kind of fertilizer, really, you can scatter it across your beds now, maybe lightly incorporate it. It's going to be fine. It can sit there. The fertilizer is not going to go away. So you can really prep your winter beds um, really late into the winter. All right. So dig versus no dig. How many people, um, you just say yes, have an endless supply of compost? Because that's a lot of what no dig is based on. Do you have ample material, organic material, usually compost, to put on your beds and cover all your beds. And I'm just curious how many people can say, yes, I have more compost than I need and I can put down four to six inches on my beds in my containers every year, no problem. And I'm gonna wait a second. And the answer usually is no, Apollo is an exception. Yes, so that's wonderful. I'm just curious how long it took for you to get to that point because a lot of new gardeners are a little bit slow in getting compost going. So number one, if you have the space, start composting now because no-dig gardens are really about the compost and it makes a huge difference. But it's hard to get enough compost. So why would you not dig your garden now, it's really two points. If you are just starting to build your garden for the first time, like my garden is clay soil. If I go out to a space that has sun, meets all the requirements, it is really compressed. I could put down cardboard. I did an experiment and it worked. I put down six inches of leaf grow and compost, planted in it, things did fine. But not everybody can do that. What I do recommend is if, you, if you're starting your garden for the first year, let me hold on a second. I'm lagging a little bit. I'm going to pause. Just waiting a second. Checking my buffer here. 
So if you're just digging your garden for the first time, it's okay to turn your soil. The fear that gets put out there that is if you turn your soil over, you're going to kill worms, you're going to disrupt the microbiology, you're going to wreck everything. And that's just not true. People have been doing it forever. The microbes figure it out. Worms are perfectly fine. And you may want to do that to loosen up your soil for you know, the first year. The reason that you don't have to keep digging is because it's really going to save you time. Once the base of your soil, you know, maybe that top four, six, eight inches is all turned, maybe you cleared out the weeds, something like that. Thereafter, you can go by just dropping in four inches of compost on top of there, 10 centimeters of compost, six inches of um, compost on there. Cover the planting area. Sometimes it's filling your raised bed. Sometimes it's restoring the mounds that you're growing in. And then you can plant directly into that. The science behind it is most of your plants grow nice extensive root systems in that top four to six inches of the soil or 10 to you know, on the top of my head, 15 centimeters of the soil. That's what you were replenishing year after year. You're putting down new stuff. You're planting into that. You get the deep roots that can penetrate into harder soils and you get the shallow roots that are loving the addition of that organic matter and that compost. And if you have an endless uh, supply of compost, you can keep putting down several inches of that year after year and you really don't have to dig your garden. The other reason that you might want to dig or turn it is you're growing carrots or crops that get longer roots and you may want to really loosen up that space. Maybe you're growing potatoes. It all really can depend on your soil, you know, what it is like going down a foot or something like that, or how tall you're building the raised bed up the side. So it does vary. I just wanted to talk a little bit about it so people didn't think that if they turned their soil or dug their garden, that they're wrecking anything. There is a lot of science, yes, that if you keep the soil kind of as is, you know, it stratifies with soil life and everything is good, but turning it doesn't kill it all off. So I just don't want people to be fearful. I am moving more towards no dig because I have plenty of compost now and it's just extra work that I don't need to do. When you go to plant in there, so say you have like a four foot by four foot raised bed, you've added your compost or space, you've added your four inches of compost, you may want to mix it in a little bit if you're going to be planting seeds into that top two inches of the soil that's there. Mix in your four inches of stuff and just make a better planting space for seeding. When you're putting in seeds, you just want to make sure you got quality, loose planting areas. So you may have to lightly dig that. If you're planting into a larger bed where it's just transplants, like you're putting in squash or cucumbers or tomatoes or peppers, you really don't have to dig that space at all. You put down your organic matter, wherever the plants are good to go, you dig a hole, you know, a small hole, throw more compost, loosen it up, maybe some organic fertilizers or whatever kind of brew you like to put in there to give your, your plants a jump and, and get growing. And then plant the plant, let it go, cover it with mulch, walk away. That's a minimal amount of work but it's a maximum benefit to the plants. They, they really do like that. So there isn't a reason to fear turning the soil in your garden. That's all I want to put out there. Let me see if anybody uh, has questions with respect to that, and then we'll move. I have a short video on the grow lights to start the conversation. And again, these uh, Garden Ground Lives will go about 20 or 30 minutes. And if you're interested in this style of learning, the PERC memberships are really set up to limit the chat room. And I spend a lot of time each month um, talking with people that sign on every, at, what do I want to say? At the end of each month, I put in all the slotted live memberships and the garden grounds. So you'll be able to check my channel and see kind of what's going on for January. I'll be putting that in tonight. All right. So let's take a look. If you put in here, because when there's a lot of people in the chat room, it's hard for me to, you know, see everything. And looking through here, I do see, you know, a lot of no's. I mean, that's just true is we just don't have a lot of, of, of compost. If you can make it, make it. Charles Dowing. Yes. Um, and I always say doubting. Is it Dowing or doubting? I apologize, Charles. I will look up your name and make sure I get it right. Um, he's, you know, compost king. He's been doing his thing forever and he does a great job of prepping his beds using the compost and he doesn't have to dig because he's bringing that material in.
Well, thanks, Kirsten. That was perfect. <laughs> Hopefully you were saying nice things. Um, let's see. Is cover crop as good as compost? So cover crops can be as good as compost, but you're basically growing the material, cutting it back, letting it die, and letting it break down. It's not as much quantity as we might think. It's better than nothing. If you have the space open to do cover crops, that's wonderful. When you compost, you're just decaying down so much matter into this great form that when you lay compost down, it is just a whole lot more than what a cover crop might bring to your, your garden space. Tony asks, when is it a good time to plant crimson clover? She's in Michigan. I don't know, to be honest with you. I don't use cover crops because I grow most of my beds into, um, into winter and I have plenty of compost. You want your cover crops to be able to get in so they get to that point just before flowering because you don't want them to flower and produce seed so that you can chop them and drop them into the ground. So I don't know. Um, you know the planting time for crimson clover but if you are in michigan i think i think it's too late it's too cold for them to germinate all right so that's dig versus no dig summary it's fine to turn your soil if you need to you don't have to every time there's not a benefit to keep turning it year after year after year if you have the compost you want to get that four inches of organic matter down 10 centimeters, maybe six inches. You can use less. It really depends on what you're growing. But that's the whole principle. So year after year, you're throwing down compost, you're planting, you're throwing down compost, you're planting. That's the gold standard. And it took me uh, <laughs> about 15 years to get to that. So it's not always that easy. Let's go right to, uh, before I do that. So I'm talking about shop lights for your garden grow lights. They're not labeled grow lights. They're not labeled for gardening. As soon as you get that label put on a light for gardening, you're paying almost 30, 50% more. It's sort of a ripoff. These are just four foot white LED shop lights that you can buy at Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's. You can check out after this video, I'll be putting in links for an affiliate program. By the way, if you want to sign up for the Rusted Garden Shop affiliate program, you will get 15% of the sale for new customers. It's all explained to you, but it's a pretty good deal. And I will put in a link for my Amazon shop if you want to go there and look at some of the white LED lights that are there. You don't have to necessarily buy the LED lights linked in my Amazon shop. They change all the time, but they're going to give you an idea of what you're looking for. So it's four foot white LED lights and they work. Let me show you why. These are tomatoes that I'm growing right now. These are Tiny Tim's. I do sell these at my seed shop. You can see that they're flowering. They're growing tomatoes. This is all being done with the basic white LED lights. So they are effective for seed starts and they're also effective for growing smaller plants. These are dwarf tomatoes indoors. All right, so while this video is running, it is about four minutes, but it's gonna really cover the basics for the white LEDs. I keep stressing that. Um, and just toss out any questions that you might have as the video is running. All right, let me find it. Today in Garden Grounds, I just talk about the actual light. The shelving unit is six feet playing. tall. You may not levels your grow light station you wish of course see the lights now let's come over here there's a kind you may find but what you really want today the leds you can see individual lights going all the way down there you can find led fluorescent tubes you can find old fluorescent tubes this is what i used years and years ago lights. then they had led right now Look for the individual white LED lights. White, you, you can spend a lot more money on systems that have, have blue lights, red lights, yellow lights, white lights. They work, they work better. However, you can find these basic shop lights. Let's give it a second so you can see or the individual LEDs. You can find these from anywhere from sometimes 50 all the way up to about $40. They're four feet long. I just want the 
the white LED shop light. Uh, Walmart, different places online. Links in the video description to Amazon Seed Shop that will direct you in the direction that maybe you want to buy the lights that way. But they're not expensive. So first of all, plug them in. They cost about one light. Eight dollars a year to run if they're on about eight hours a day. So they're efficient. You're not going to spend a lot of money on there. And actually, just two lights is probably all you need. Notice I have a four foot light there, one in the back. The shelves are four foot wide or four feet wide. The shelves themselves hold a seed flat. All this stuff I do sell at my seed shop. And it sets you up. And you can get in one flat, two flats, three flats four flats. That is a lot of transplants that you can grow for your garden and save a ton of money. Seriously, when you're buying four dollars, when you're buying plants at four dollars a plant at the big box stores, it adds up pretty quickly. Now some of these are beat up. I just got back from vacation, but they pretty much survived well enough. I'm even growing tomatoes down there. Next thing is how long do you want to leave the lights on? Because they're white LED lights, and light intensity is so important. When you first start out growing, you want the lights to sit about two inches, five centimeters above the seed starting mix. You want the lights on at least 12 hours. I recommend 14 to 16 when they're first germinating and you wanna leave the lights on longer and closer to the starting mix for about a week after the seed germinates. That's gonna get you a nice stocky, strong seed. As the plant grows, if you want to subscribe and follow me, I'll be talking about how to adjust the lights. But 14 hours on, 16 hours on when they first germinate, 12 to 14 hours thereafter. And you really do want to keep them close. As your plants get bigger, my lights vary in distance from the plants, and I will go over that in the future. The key to the lights, white LED, you want to get a rating of 5,000 lumens. That is the brightness of the light. If you get something higher than 5,000 lumens, that's fine. A little bit lower, that's fine. And you want the light color to be, really if you can find it, I think it's 6,100 Kelvin, but 5,000 Kelvin or higher, the better. That mimics daylight. So it's 5,000 lumens, 5,000 Kelvin, white LED shop lights, and that's all you need to really set up growing indoors under lights and you don't have to spend a lot of money. All right, so that is the basic lights that you can use. And I noticed somebody said that they had seed starts that did better in their bay window. So a window can work, but it's really rare. So a bay window, from my understanding, is usually bumped out. So if you are in a bay window that truly gets southern sun and western sun, that window will get plenty of light and that will help grow seed starts. However, most of us don't have windows like that. We get windows that have a couple hours of bright sun, direct sun coming through, and they just don't do well. So in that case, you're very lucky. So I'm glad you have a space that you can grow like that. The grow lights, you can see how my plants grew. They work well, they're effective. And when you're doing transplants, you, and the peas that you saw that were beat up and some spinach, I'm actually growing that for food. They got a little beat up because I went away for a week and they weren't watered. Um, grow lights, the white LED grow lights are really best for transplants. They can grow smaller leafy plants, smaller tomatoes to production, but they're not set up for full production of plants. Again, the whole goal is transplants. Let's see, the foil is there, yes, to reflect light. Um, that's not necessary, it reflects light. It also keeps some heat around there too. Plants like your pepper seeds enjoy a little bit more warmth. I think you saw a heating mat there. If you want to subscribe and follow me, these uh, garden grounds will focus on different aspects of starting seeds indoors for January and February. And basically the three topics are going to just follow what I'm doing out in my garden or inside getting ready to go out in the garden. All right, let me just check real quick some questions in here. And we're at the 20 minute mark, so we'll go about 10 more minutes if people have questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Do 
Just checking for some quick questions I can answer. Doubting, thank you. I thought it was doubting. So I answered a couple of questions that were thrown out there. Jules, um, the peas, he just said that he replicated the uh, pea growing. A lot of people don't know that you can eat the pea tendrils, the soft shoots that come out, they taste like peas. I've been growing them inside in different ways and they are really prolific. They keep growing, you trim them, you give them you know, you a water soluble fertilizer, they keep growing, you keep trimming them. So you get really nice additions to your sal salad greens. Okay, Philip. I just bought some grow lights, which are 6,400 Kelvin. That is the uh, type of light. So as you get to 6,100 Kelvin, that's more daylight, like a full sunny day. Kelvin ratings can go past that. I just learned that about a year ago. But 5,000 to 6,100 Kelvin works fine. If you go higher than that, I mean, there's no harm or foul. 5,000 lumens. So good question. And that was really the next thing. I'll answer Philip's question in a second. So this is just the general setup to get the basic white lights. 5,000 lumens, 5,000 Kelvin or higher, four feet. You can set them up however you wish. Now, depending on how intense your light is, so as you get higher in the lumens, if you get to 6,000 lumens, 7,000 lumens, the distance, I always say two inches or five centimeters. At germination because when my plants when your plants germinate they are looking only for sunlight so if you're waiting to turn your lights on for germination that's a problem always have your lights on before germination and then I recommend about seven days after germination keeping those lights at about two inches you could go up to four inches five inches or six inches and your lights will be perfectly fine your plants will be perfectly fine this is just the guideline two inches four inches etc if you notice the tips of your leaves getting brown that means the light is too close so take notes adjust it raise them you know maybe if you start at two inches raise them to four inches see how they do and you sort of have to get a sense of where your lights fit best one of the things um, that this today's Garden Grounds really isn't about is how do you adjust the lights afterwards. After that week of growth, you can raise them to four to six inches. They are less dependent on the light. You can cut the hours of light down. And by doing that, as you get bigger plants, you raise the lights, you cut the hours down. Sometimes you can move those flats um, to a window at that point you get enough light there you can move the flats outside if it's staying warm during the day warmer during the day I should say not freezing maybe 40 degrees give them an hour of light to get them used to the sunlight there's a lot you can do as these transplants begin to grow but today's video is really about focusing on the light you need to be successful for growing transplants setting them up and the distance to really get your seeds healthy one week after germination. All right, let's see what other questions might be here. The foil, that might be the old question that I just buzzed by, but the foil is just to reflect some light back and keep some heat in there. Jillian, uh, so here's a good question, or I'm sorry for the problem actually. If you bring plants in from the outdoors, there's no nature really inside your house. So the warmth, the light, the insects go crazy. So that is one of the downsides of trying to overwinter plant. You're bringing in insects. Um, one tip, if you put about an inch of play sand on top of your soil of the plants that you brought in, that interrupts the life cycle of the fungus gnats and it might help kill them off. I'm not sure about thripes. When you're seed starting, just search garden topics. I have like 1,500 gardening videos. The seed starting mix could have fungus gnat eggs in there. So I recommend hydrating it with boiling water. Kills off the fungus gnat eggs. Things are good. You don't need soil life for seed starting indoors. They'll get plenty of soil life when they're out there. And I'll be talking about that in future garden grounds. All right. Uh, Debbie has about Debbie 
has a question about ordering worm castings through your link. Do you recommend premium or standard? So there's two varieties um, of Vermistera. The standard will work. I like the premium. I just use a little bit less. It's a little more worm castings, but based on your budget, if the standard is going to work just fine. Tonya's Townhouse, is it a bad thing for lights to be on 24-7? It is ongoing for two or three days after germination. No, it's not bad. You can do that as a strategy, but they do need a dark cycle as they're developing. So after a couple days after germination, I would go to 12, 14, 16 hours on, 12, 10, 8 hours off, something like that. Starting plants are in my book, um, not super in depth, but generally speaking about like the stuff that we're doing now. Um, and it doesn't talk, it doesn't necessarily talk about specific plants. It's more of an overview um, with some details in it and stuff like that, um, depending on what you're looking for. But you can really find a lot on seed starting on my channel every year from January 1 to December 31st. I pretty much kind of restart what I do, go over the information. So there's a whole lot on that. Humidity in seed starting, it's not really that big of a deal. If your place is dry, you're gonna have to water more. I don't use humidity domes. I found they cause more problems than not. And if you're able to check on your plants several times a week, you really don't need a humidity dome. You just keep it watered. All right, so we're almost to the end. The last part that I wanted to just kind of throw out there as a topic is you can save money now, December, January, even the beginning of February, if you go to, and a lot of the sales may have passed, but then also they put on all kinds of stuff on sale. So you can find it, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, other bigger chain stores, great discounts on fertilizers, um, insecticides, organic and not, um, sometimes on seeds, not really on seed starting supplies. Um, they always seem to stay at full price. But these stores start putting everything on sale from this year where you have winters. And they basically are just getting rid, you know, using that space for the Christmas stuff. Christmas stuff is on sale now. And then in January, they just blow out all kinds of stuff to bring in the new products for, you know, February and such. My point. I got plenty of, I think they were 20 pound bags of fertilizer that are normally 20 some dollars for $2.50. I've gone over and got fish emulsion at a great discount. That's an organic water soluble fertilizer. So if you have time, you're out and about checking your local Home Depots and Lowe's, checking in the garden section for fertilizers and such. Also going over to where there is the grass seed and all that kind of stuff. Sometimes they have big bags of organic fertilizer there on sale. That's where you find really good sales. And then going into where their chemicals are. Good chemicals, bad chemicals, all that. You can pick you know, what suits you. But they all start going on sale and you can really save a fortune. I have, In fact, I have enough organic granular fertilizer to last me the next five years. In addition to that, I also started producing a lot of compost, so I don't even need it that much. My point, it was like 50, 60, maybe 70, 20 pound bags of plant tone that I got for $2, donated a lot to the um, farm that I volunteer at, kept a bunch of bags for myself, but it was really maybe $150, $200 that I spent, a lot to outlay, but if I kept all that fertilizer, it doesn't go bad. And that's going to last me five years and longer. It'll last me 10 years if I kept it all, if I didn't donate some of it. All right, let's end with this question because it'll be part of a garden uh, grounds coming up. The next garden grounds will be on January 5th, uh, January 26th, Thursday at 11 a.m. And I'll be talking about fungus gnats. Fungus gnats are the problem of seed starting in greenhouses in your house. Number one, when you get the seed starting mix, hydrate it with boiling water, kill off the fungus gnat eggs. That's the best way to do it. 
Once you get fungus gnats, they are always laying eggs, going to the root systems. The larva eats the roots, weakens your plant. They mature, they fly around, and they keep the cycle going. You can try stronger sprays. I don't mind using uh, stronger sprays, some of the chemical types, on my seed starts. It's not going to harm me or the plant you know, once they're outside and stuff like that. You can try neem oil. That can work too. You can do a neem oil drench where you're mixing neem oil into your watering. Neem oil is organic, soaks up into the soil, can kill them off. You can use mos mosquito dunks, which is um, organic. It's a BT. I forget the um, technical name, but it's basically a um, natural microbe that will kill off insects in the soil. They're not 100% effective, but they do reduce it. And sometimes that's what you're trying to do is just reduce the damage from fungus nets. All right. So that was Gardening Grounds. Again, I do this um, live twice a month. The next one is January 5th, January 26th at 11 a.m. The topics will be going up uh, today on my YouTube channel. I hope you subscribe. And again, if you like this kind of format, think about joining the Perk memberships. You can just go to my channel. You'll see membership everywhere. In the video description, you can click membership and decide if that's something for you. All right. I hope you guys have a wonderful new year. And I will see you all at the next Garden Grounds.